Welcome to the Center for Universal Oneness. We are an open, welcoming, spiritual community that supports all faith traditions and invites you to join us on your spiritual journey. We host different speakers each week to guide and inspire us. We are guided by universal principles of acceptance of all that is sacred, and we strive to live in the oneness of love. Please enjoy this presentation. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, David is a returning speaker, and his presentation today is Shall We Dance? It's a great title. I can't wait to hear what that all is going to involve. Let me tell you a little about David, if you don't know already. He is a spiritual seeker, first of all, all his life. But in addition to that, you know, he's a unity minister in, at Independence. And they also have a service every Sunday, and they, those services are recorded. So there's opportunities to go there and hear David in other venues. Uh, Grammy award-winning tenor. I remember the first time he presented at our little in-person thing, he sang a song, <laughs> shocked us all. It's like, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> who is our speaker today who has this beautiful voice? I love that he calls himself a pragmatic optimist. I think of myself that way too, pragmatic optimist, that spirituality can lead us in practical ways to discovering new ways to live our truth, move through circumstances with wonder. That's how I want to move through mine with wonder. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's a, just the opposite. And uh, David loves nature, good books. He's grounded in the earth. So welcome today, David. We'll turn the screen over to you. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's always interesting to uh, to sit here and hear someone talk about you, <laughs> and kind of kind of laugh along and go, "Oh yeah, that's 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 true. I get that." So, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And we were just having a conversation around around what it's been like engaging again. You know, in this in this, we're not even we can't call it post COVID. We're not pre COVID anymore. We're just in this time and just how we are learning to sort of uh, wend our way through this. We, we learn, we adapt, we grow, we shift. And I'm saying all this because it really ties into to the message I'd like to share today. So lately I've been drawn to the Old Testament prophets and given what's going on in the world, it, their stories really kind of resonate with what we're seeing in many ways. And the work of a prophet is to point out the painful conditions in our world and then move through them with the listener on a path toward a greater, more fulfilling experience of life. And I think this path to a more free and joyful state of being is a spiritual one. And as we progress on this journey, an understanding of spiritual law becomes etched on our hearts, as Jeremiah says in the final chapter of the book of Jeremiah. It's a lesson in giving and receiving. We discover ways to give our attention over to our higher authority, the presence of God within. And to the level we allow this giving over of ourselves, we receive guidance and support and loving instruction from an all-loving God that only desires to experience life more abundantly through us. We give, we receive, we stumble, and by grace, balance is restored, and this affords us the ability to rise and begin this process again. Give, receive, give thanks. Give, receive, give thanks. Give and receive, ebb and flow, bend and straighten, back and forth, lead and follow. When these activities become coordinated within us, a cohesive wholeness or innate balance is achieved. But this sounds an awful lot like a dance, don't you think? There's a balance we are called to find as spiritual beings in human form. Our spiritual nature senses and experiences oneness with all beings and desires to express that. Our human nature, as we're attentive to spirit, has the potential to embody and apply these spiritual ideas into our daily sensory relational encounters. So how do we dance in both worlds? How does our human nature 
learn to cooperate with spirit and divine law, creating this cohesive whole. This wholeness is something that's aware of, or not aware of, or intent on maintaining its singularity. But it wishes to participate in this greater dance of all life. Now, on a side note, I remember a number of years ago being involved in a production that, as its central feature, had a big sort of tribal dance moment. Now, the company had hired dancers to perform a majority of the work, but they wanted the artists to also be able to step in and fill in the gaps. So the director, as he's looking around the room on the first day, and regardless of how much I tried to hide, he picked me out of the lineup to dance. And I remember him saying, well, you just kind of look like a dancer, which in my mind could have been nothing further from the truth. But we'll come back to this dance story in just a little bit. Today's scripture from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14 reads, David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. Now David, which in Hebrew means beloved, is considered a type of Christ. David represents divine love individualized in human consciousness. In other words, the stories of David's life represent the expansion of our capacity to be led by love in our daily practice. Dancing before the Lord represents that divine love being expressed from within into every one of our activities, and in David's case, including gratitude for his body temple. His being clothed in a linen ephod, which was a priestly garment, represents being clothed in spiritual understanding. But what in the world made David dance like this? Now, David's dance marks the arrival of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. He and a group of his men moved it from Abinadab, where it had been stored for many years. Now, moving this ark was no insignificant or small task. The ark contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments given to Moses when the Israelites fled Egypt, the law which outlines the covenant between God and the Israelites. It also contained a golden jar of manna, a symbol of God's provision for those who were faithful. And it also contained Moses' brother Aaron's rod, which had bloomed a reminder that this covenant was everlasting and that those who honored it would flourish. Now, by design, the ark was a sturdy and quite heavy thing, requiring hands to move it that could both steady its weight and respect the sacred nature of that which it carried. Within us, the ark of the covenant is the original spark of divine love, the essence of which we're all created. The ark and this vessel that houses it are indeed God-inspired creations. As it says in the book of Genesis, we are created in the image and likeness of God. And this innate divine love desires to move from Abinadab, or the realm of spiritual thought or divine potential, and fully inhabit Jerusalem this habitation of peace where it can flourish within us, such that it can express fully through and as us. Now, about this dance sequence that I've been recruited to perform. So we started rehearsing, and I was so uncomfortable. And I even told the choreographer that I could learn this dance, but that I was not a dancer. So it was going to take some time for it to sink in. But from day one, I just felt like everybody was staring at me, waiting for me to mess up. And I promise I fulfilled their expectations. And I messed up royally over and over again. I got so frustrated with myself because learning sequence and rhythm came to me so easily as a singer. But yet I couldn't wrap my head, let alone my feet, around this particular sequence. And interestingly, my confidence as a singer was even a little shaken in light of this situation. Now, after one particularly frustrating rehearsal, the choreographer pulled me aside along with Scott, one of the young dancers. 
She told me she could see that I knew all of the steps and appreciated how hard I was trying, but she also pointed out the problem. I was so worried about doing the right step at the right time that my heart was absolutely not in the process. I had to learn to trust and then move, trusting that my body would remember what it had to do in the moment. And I vaguely remember her saying something like this, when you're dancing, feel like there is energy within you that is dying to get out. With every movement, feel like you are flinging that energy out of you and into the world. And the next time we did the routine, I was perfect. The end. Not at all. Not at all. So during King David's journey, there was a point at which the ark became unsteady on the cart that held it. And one of the drivers of the cart, Uzzah, instinctively reached out and, and tried to steady it and was struck down by God for touching the ark. Now, before we get too disturbed by the literal image here, Uzzah metaphysically represents human strength. So to understand this a little more clearly, Think of a time when you have said that you've put your trust in God within around some situation, perhaps a health challenge or a potential career change or releasing feelings of hurt or anger or betrayal toward another person. And having experienced the freedom of this trust filled relationship in other areas of your life, you naturally make this promise to yourself to turn this situation over to spirit as well. But at some point, you find yourself facing that situation again. You feel physically limited by that health challenge or the job you hope for falls through or you get fired or you have yet another painful exchange with the person that you felt hurt by. The promise you made to entrust the situation to spirit begins to feel a little unsteady and uncertain. And you question that commitment that you've made. And rather than turning that situation over to spirit yet again in that moment, you react. Maybe you spend hours on Google looking for medical advice or other opinions rather than relying on those to whom you normally entrust your health care. Or you second and third guess your choices around employment and wonder how the heck you got here in the first place. Or maybe you treat the person you feel hurt you poorly. You dig in your heels and feel justified in your upset. This is the Uzza state of mind. When we lose sight of our connection with that divine presence within ourselves, that love in its most pure form, we also begin to lose sight of it in others. We see our circumstances and interactions as somehow adversarial, things that we have to overcome or dominate. We grab hold of what we've sworn to turn over and try to manage it ourselves, forcing the outcome that we desire, trying to force balance. But this display of human strength does not fuse with spirit and will be met with resistance. When we trust any situation to spirit, our ongoing work is to continue to surrender it over and over again. Give it over to spirit and receive the gift of peace in that moment. Give and receive. Give and receive and give thanks. Now, King David, having seen this happen to Uzzah, begins to worry. Was he doing the right thing by bringing the covenant all the way into Jerusalem? This cohesive whole that he sought to create by returning the ark to his people suddenly seemed a fearful endeavor. David became afraid of God in that moment and his trust in his decision to do this was broken. So rather than bring the ark into Jerusalem, he chose to leave the ark in the nearby town of Obed-Edom. And Obed-Edom was blessed. 
while David returned to Jerusalem and probably sat questioning his decision. When we experience the aftermath of trying to take control of a situation rather than trusting spirit at work, we can feel pretty shaken up. Maybe that endless Google search has left you with more questions than answers, maybe even questioning your choice of care <clears throat> or the doubts you have about your choice to change jobs morphs into wondering if you are in fact even employable or that blow up you had with your former friend or spouse or business partner leaves you quite confusingly feeling both embarrassed by your behavior and even more set in the idea that your behavior is justified. This ebb and flow of life to which you aspire and experience in other areas in this situation feels like a tug of war with you on the dragging end of the rope. This cohesive whole that you seek, allowing love to fully inhabit every aspect of your being seems more unattainable. Maybe you don't believe that you deserve a joyful life of abundance when it comes to that particular situation. Others may have it, you can't. And rather than looking into bringing even more love to that situation, rather than taking it into prayer and reflection and seeking ways to invite healing, you place your attention elsewhere. You place it on other things, just like David did when he left the ark in a nearby town. You focus on areas of life that feel like they are working. You throw yourself into activities that let you feel good and deserving and of service to others. And those areas continue to grow and thrive and prosper in your experience. But that cohesive wholeness you long for where absolutely every aspect of your life is a co-creation with God within, that cohesive wholeness remains elusive. Now, returning to my dance story, in truth, even with all of the help, I still kept getting in my head and messing it up. But rather than feeling like I was stumbling and fumbling through an intense series of tiny little movements, following the choreographer's guidance, I started to feel just a little bit less awkward. I stopped trying to correct myself in the moment and placed my focus on what I desired. And that was just to do well. And that desire went from being uh, like wistful hopes of perfection to just doing my best and learning through each repetition. With Scott, the young dancer's help, these movements continued to move from being disjunct gestures toward a cohesive series. And in the places where that cohesive series became interrupted, places where I got stuck and became afraid and maybe held back, those places became isolated such that they could be addressed individually. I started making fewer mistakes. And when I did slip up, I knew that I could trust that the choreographer and Scott, who were right there, that they would support me in making any necessary correction. Now to put this into our give and receive and give thanks model, it all looked something like this. I gave up trying to figure it out on my own and received steady guidance from those willing to help. I gave thanks by getting less upset when I made a mistake and learning to just keep going. I gave up thinking I was incapable of achieving this one thing and thinking I was somehow too clumsy to figure it out. I received through being open to even more instruction and the gift of recognizing how our collective efforts were beginning to pay off. And I gave thanks by just starting to enjoy the dance. Now, for King David, 
when he heard of the blessings that had been poured out on Obed-Edom through the presence of the ark, he decided to take action. He gathered his team once again and brought that ark all the way into Jerusalem. No longer living in fear of God, he chose to trust the blessing that honoring his promise to keep the covenant safe would afford. And the city of David was blessed in all ways. And in the wake of this blessing, David danced. The flow of spirit in our lives is inexorable. It can't ever be fully cut off. Now, we might diminish it through errored thinking or behavior, or we might tune it out and tune out the guidance that it affords, but it's never unavailable. In the face of that diagnosis, that career change, that relationship challenge, God within is there. God waits for us to be ready to accept and willingly choose to let love flow. And the degree to which we allow it, that love pours out, pressed down, shaking together, running over. And this is the grace that I call the dance. For King David, this choice and his willingness to take action regardless of his fears, restored balance. He gave up his fear, and in giving it up, he and all the people of Israel received blessings. David's dance, and I feel fairly certain that he was not the only one dancing that day, was a dance of celebration. It was a dance of thanksgiving, a dance of freedom. Now, the lesson I've learned from the dance lesson about myself that I shared, the more free I became from my own self-doubts and fears, the more open I became to instruction. And the more open I became to instruction, the more each lesson seemed to stick. And the more those lessons stuck, the more I became open to listening, the more willing to those who could offer the best guidance became to speak. Now, by the time the performances came, I certainly was not the best dancer on the stage, but I did indeed move with more confidence. I'd become free to be an integral part of something bigger than myself, surrounded by others that were doing their best and that were also willing to support me in doing the same. Now, as we prepare for a brief meditation, I have a few questions for you. How flexible are you in this dance of life? In what areas are you fairly confident with life's ebb and flow, intuitively knowing when to give, when to receive, when to lead, when to follow? Are there areas where you might feel unsteady or rigid, maybe even feeling justified in your rigidity? And if you recognize an area like this, would you be willing to turn that thought or that behavior or that situation over to the activity of God within? If you knew the result, would be an even greater flow of love and joy in your life. Would you be willing to do this? Would you be willing to dance, to give and receive, to give and receive, to lead and follow, ebb and flow, over and over again? Consider the words of that choreographer that I shared earlier. When you're dancing, feel like there is energy within you that is dying to get out. With every movement, feel like you are flinging that energy out of you and into the world. When you become willing to lean into this dance called life, that arc of energy within you only wants to be expressed, that original spark of divine love simply wants to pour forth in endless supply. 
So every day this week, and perhaps every day ongoing, as long as you can remember this conversation, I invite you to consider how many ways you might be able to fling this energy out of you, this energy of love into the world. So let's take a moment and prepare ourselves for this dance in a time of meditation. I invite you to just sit comfortably wherever you are right now. <clears throat> Breathe and relax. With each inhalation, feel the love that is present all around you. Enter in and fill your heart space with each exhalation. Imagine that love, that divine spark within you, pouring out and into the world. Ebb and flow. Give and receive and give thanks. I'd like to take a little time in silence which, with each of these ideas and as I speak the word, I will speak it a few times. And I invite you to speak it aloud if you choose or silently to yourself. Today, I give. Today, I give. Today, I give. And we rest in the silence. I open myself to receive. I open myself to receive. I open myself to receive. And I relax in the silence in the silence, in the silence. In all things, I give thanks. In all things, I give thanks. In all things, I give thanks. And I am grateful for a moment in the silence, in the silence, in the silence.
Father, Mother, everything God, we are grateful for the opportunity, for the awareness and the understanding of the power of being willing to give and receive, to enter into this energetic flow, this energetic dance of life such that it inspires healing within us in every aspect of our life. And that healing flows through us into the world, bringing healing, bringing understanding. And as we move into the rest of our day and into the week ahead, may we continue to keep ourselves clothed in spiritual understanding. May we continue to joyfully engage in this dance of life, honoring the sacred presence that lies within each of us. In the name and in the nature of the living Christ presence within, we say, and so it is. Amen.